Hello everyone and welcome to Temple Israel for our springtime Laker concert featuring two of Broadway's brightest lights, four-time Tony nominee Judy Kuhn and the amazing host of Sirius XM's on Broadway, Seth Rudetsky. Today's concert will include a seamless mix of behind-the-scenes stories prompted by Seth's funny, insightful, and revealing questions and the songs from each star's stellar Broadway career. Judy Kuhn has graced the Broadway stage in everything from the original Broadway cast of Les Mis to Chess, Rags, Fun Home, and most recently as Golda in Fiddler on the Roof, to name a few. And she is famous for being the voice of Disney's Pocahontas. Wow! Seth's gifted work as a pianist has been heard in more than a dozen Broadway shows, including Ragtime, Les Mis, and Phantom of the Opera. A big thank you as well to Broadway Plus for helping to bring these two stars to us and curating today's program. At a time when Broadway and the arts has remained largely shuttered by the pandemic, we are so fortunate and grateful to be able to support this program through the warmth and generosity of the Laker family, Marty and Renee, in loving memory of Sarah and Harry Laker, who continue to give the gift of music to our congregation and community, Lador Vador from generation to generation, year to year, and for many years to come. On behalf of Temple Israel, we thank you and we love you. And now, with so much excitement and without further ado, Temple Israel proudly presents Judy Kuhn and Seth Rudetsky. Hi, Temple Israel. We're going to go a little bit more contemporary than that. Um, <laughs> Judy Cute is laughing. I can hear you. <laughs> Just so you know, first of all, I want to thank the cancer. I want to thank everybody for watching. Um, you guys are in Michigan. We're in New York. We are a hundred percent live right now. There's a lot of mislabeling of things and the cause of being a live stream that's filmed, edited, auto-tuned, quite frankly, and then streamed out. That's a live stream. We are literally live right now. So it's what? It's five. I'm looking at my iPhone. It is oh my god, five o'clock exactly, and I'm never on time. Five o'clock exactly. I'm looking at the comments as they're coming up. This is exciting. Thank you, Debbie. I agree. Can't wait to hear the music, Diane. I agree with you. So let me start with the song with Judy Kuhn, and then we will get into some Broadway and we will get into some Judaica, a combination. Please welcome Ms. Judy Kuhn. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Michigan. Hi, Jude. You ready? We're going to start with um, something that implies what the rest of the concert is going to be like. Mm. Out of the tree of life, I just picked me a plum. You came along and everything started to hum. Still, it's a real good bet. The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come, and babe, won't it be fun? You think you've seen the sun, but you ain't seen it shine. Wait till the warm up's under. sunshine day you ain't seen nothing yet the best is yet to come and babe won't it be fine the best is yet to come come the day you're mine come the day you're mine I'm gonna teach Drain the cup dry. 
to come, babe, won't it be fine? The best is yet to come, come the day you're mine. Come the day you're mine. Come the day you're mine. <laughs> Okay, Michigan, I'm hoping you guys are applauding. <laughs> <laughs> so it is, this virtual world that we live in is very weird. However, we, as far as I know, Judy, we are the only people that do live concerts. I don't know any other concerts that has this technology. It's because they have a catch or tech person. So we are know. like at a higher level. However, I will just say I'm reading the com I'm literally reading the comments as I'm playing. And uh -huh. I'm like, oh, my God, everyone loves Broadway. And then I'm like, wait, they're writing about sports? And I was like, what the <laughs> hell? Turns out because they wrote the Lakers are the best. And I was like, oh. what? I didn't realize it's actually Marty and Renee Laker because they're the sponsors. <laughs> but I literally thought they somehow segued to a sports conversation. I'm like, why are you right about the Lakers? <laughs> okay, ignore that. Um, okay, Judy Kuhn, we want to talk. Hi, um, Seth. Hi, lady. We it's got so to good talk to see you. Broadway. I know. Judy, Judy and I, anyway, Judy and I do a lot of concerts. Just so you know, I began as a super, super psycho fan of Judy from listening to the original Lamest Cast album. So it's crazy that now I do concerts with her. Obsessed. Um, <laughs> I would love for people to know. I think people always are like, how do you make it in the business? And so much of it is arbitrary because you had the talent, but I'd love for you to talk. You told me that story once about uh, it was the King and I audition. It was this random. Oh, yes. Talk about the arbitrariness of that. I love it. Well, it's a crazy, it's maybe my craziest audition story. I was uh, just, sorry, I'm futzing with my ear thing. Yeah. Um, futzing, uh, it's for a temple. Yeah. Futzing, anybody? <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, I was newcomer to New York I went to an open call which is when you you get there early you put your name on a long long list like hundreds of people yes and I was did not have my equity card so I wasn't part of the union yet so it was a, what they call an open non-equity call and it was for a um, I, th I think it was for cor a chorus Chorus parts in a new Broadway musical. I can't remember what the show was. Um, but uh, I went and I put my name on the list. And they wanted, they were looking for sopranos who could sing a high note. And so I had, I had in my repertoire my Lord and Master from The King and I, which has that high note at the end. You'll never know. I love it. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um... I, you know, put my name on the list, waited around for hours and hours and hours. They had this, they, they were, did this terrible thing where they had, um, they called 10 people up and you stood in line in this hallway and the, um, the door was open. So you watched everyone who went before you and everyone behind you was watching your audition. So you're already being judged by the people behind the table, exactly. but also your fellow sopranos so are like. Surrounded by judgment. <laughs> So I did the last 16 bars or whatever of My Lord and Master and walked out of the room and some a woman chased me down as I was leaving and said, was that you? And I said, yes. And she said, would you come in tomorrow and audition for Mike Lee and Yul Brynner? And it turned out that <laughs> the... The Yul Brynner's last national tour of The King and I was rehearsing down the hall, and they just happened to be on a lunch break, so they, um, you know, the doors were open, so they could hear the auditions going on down the hall. And they just also happened to be, have been told by their tough Tim that she needed to take a few months off from the tour because she was going to get married. And that was her song you were singing. Yes. Oh my God. And so then, so I, you know, they, they needed a new under, they were going to bump up the, the understudy, her understudy, and then they needed a new understudy and someone who could be in the chorus. It was just the weirdest kind of confluence of events and just, you know, it, it, it just very strange. So I went in the next day and I auditioned and they basically offered me the job on the spot. And three or four months later, I flew to wherever they were, I think St. Louis maybe, and um, joined the tour. It's so arbitrary. It's like having a blind date, but you wind up marrying the waiter. You know what I mean? It's <laughs> like you weren't auditioning for it. I know. 
I didn't get that other job that I can't remember what it was that I was auditioning for. <laughs> I heard I heard you bring you bring it was kind of a cranky ass at that point. It was like his eightieth time doing King and I. Oh, wait. Tell me about the bowing. He wasn't having it. Oh. <laughs> Um, well, it's hard to demonstrate in a virtual way. Maybe you can demonstrate. I will. Um, so uh, uh, he insisted on getting a um, standing ovation every night. And so he would m come march down to that, you know, his bow music. Dun, 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 dun. And then he'd stand at the lip of the stage. And all he could really see, I mean, most of the audience was in the dark. And all he could really see was the first row. And so if, the f if he didn't see the first, even if the entire rest of the house was on its feet, if he didn't see the people in the first row standing up, he would just stand there and he'd turn around and he'd bow to the audience. I mean, bow to the co company and give his rear end to the audience. <laughs> he would show his, yes. the king and arse. Yes, so that was really interesting. <laughs> the, the, the story I know about, about Yul Brenner is from um, Anthony Rapp. A lot of, I know there are a lot of theater fans in... Um, at Temple Israel, that's mm -hmm. why they're here. The comments are amazing. So Anthony Rapp, the no, original. No, I can't see them. Well, oh yeah, I'm lucky. Well, yeah, I'm reading all the comments. So Anthony Rapp, you know, from Rent, when he was when ah, he was a little boy, <clears throat> he did. Um, he was a little boy in the national tour of King and I. He took over, and he said he was like 10 years old, and he said he was doing the final scene of King and I, and it's this giant theater, and he's supposed to come out and be like, you know, mother, the boat, and the king is completely. Dying, he's like uh, literally about to die like two minutes <laughs> later. So he said, "Your Brenner's in, in bed, like about to die, and is Anthony's first performance. He's ten years old, and he goes, Mother, the boat, and he suddenly hears from Yul Brenner, louder.'" <laughs> Sounds like Mr. Brenner. <laughs> You're supposed to be dying <laughs> and stop giving me notes. <laughs> Any to the who? Okay, so um, because you know, because it is Temple Israel, we're trying to, we're trying to theme it a little Judaically. So. <laughs> Judy's, Judy's had her share of, uh, of Jewish musicals. We said Fiddle, Fiddle on the Roof, but she did another show, which a lot of people don't know, which is one of my absolute favorite shows on Broadway ever. However, it's not very well known. It's by Charles Strauss, who wrote Annie and mm -hmm. Bye Bye Birdie, and Stephen Schwartz, who wrote you know Wicked and Gospel and everything. Mm -hmm. And it was called Rags. And we always think of it as Fiddler on the Roof Part 2, even though it's not. Right. But you know they leave on a Tefka, right. and then where the H are they going? Rags is about... Everyone coming to America. So it's what is it, nineteen seventeen or something? It's no, it, I think it. Oh God, I can't remember the exact year. It's not. Uh, I think it might be a few years earlier than that. Whenever the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory um, happened, devastatingly, true, it's right around that time. That is right. That does date it. So, oh wow, I, I should know that. I feel like it was nine. I think it's like. 1970. I feel it's like that because my grandma okay. knew people in that. Maybe someone fire. can put that in the comments. Yeah, does anyone know when the Charles Trippies Factory um, happened? Um, anyway, because my I played a character named Bella, who who comes to America. And by the way, the book was written by Joe Stein, who wrote Fiddler on the Roof. So the for him, it it wasn't a sequel because it wasn't about the same characters, but it was sort of what happened to those people once they ar arrived in New York Harbor. And so my character was named Bella, who arrives with her father, and um, uh, she ultimately dies in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. So and that does date it. Nineteen eleven. Well, someone says nineteen eleven. Someone says nineteen nineteen. This is classic horse <coughs> mule. Okay. Horse mule. Well, classic synagogue. Okay. Well, we're gonna look it up. That's what Google's for. Um, <laughs> anyway, but. So are we going to do the song from Rags? Is that what we're leading yes, up to? Yes, we're leading so to I, that. Okay. So Bella, who comes with her father, um, th on the boat, they meet this woman named Rebecca, who's coming over with her young son to look for her husband, who left for America a few years before, and he, they never heard from him again. He was supposed to send for them. So she's there with her young son, and they befriend each other on the boat. And Rebecca comes and lives with Bella and her father and their, her aunt and uncle who they're staying with. So this song that I'm going to sing actually was sung by Rebecca. I'm too, way too old for Bella now. Um, Not the right makeup. <laughs> um, and I, it, I love this song. Um, what happens is that uh, she can't, she, you know, she arrives and finds that America is an awfully big place and she doesn't really know how to begin looking for her husband. Um, but she does get a job 
at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, but she survives that. Um, and she meets this young man who's a union organizer mm. and befriends him. And he basically starts showing her the town. And this on this particular night, he's taken her to see the Yiddish theater. And he walks her home and leaves her at her doorstep. And even though she's married, she's having some spilkas, as we say. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's way past time when I should be home in bed. But I'm standing here on this moonlit street instead. Wanna drink the breeze in and bathe in lantern light. Oh, my reason's gone, and I blame it on the summer night. I see couples pass and they're to say you're one of us what's going on here the street is full of lunatics sharing some pagan right if we're here till dawn can we blame it on the summer night I keep remembering his Just the shameless summer night. I've got to stop this. I never felt so giddy. Why are the stars? so bright through the streets I wander and blame it on the summer night maybe the sun will come soon maybe the morning will save me clearing my mind giving me back my sun Sweet, seductive summer night. Ooh. 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 Okay, isn't it beautiful? Everyone, all these beautiful comments. Thank you, Joshua. I do, I do agree. It's fabulous. So that show, Judy, tell everybody <laughs> the devastation of that show and the horrific way you found out oh, about the devastation of it. It was a crazy, it was my baptism of fire. It was my first featured role in a big show like that. We had our, the, they'd fired the director after the first two weeks of rehearsal. We had no director. Anyway, it's a long story. We played Boston, which worked out for me because I met my husband while we were there. Schwab. Schwab. Um, uh, and uh, so we then we came back to New York. Um, we they hired a director last minute. It was crazy. The show was beautiful, but very troubled. You know, it just needed work. Um, and uh, so 
it was opening night. I, I, it was the day, sorry, it was the day after opening night. It was, you know, I was so still sort of flying high from the opening night party and I was cleaning my apartment and I had the TV news on and I saw the RAGS logo come up and I thought, oh, how exciting, they're going to review my show. So I turned up the volume and I was looking at the TV and the person on the TV looked at back at me and said, RAGS, which opened last night at the Mark Hellinger Theater, will close tomorrow after four performances. So they gave a press release <laughs> Without telling the cast. Exactly. So you were literally exactly. had a vacuum in your hand. Exactly. And the next thing I knew, the phone rang, the old-fashioned kind that was plugged into the wall. The phone rang, and w the stage management said, um, there's going to be a company meeting uh, at, you know, 7 o'clock tonight. And I was like, gee, I wonder what they're going to tell us. Oh, my God. So you lasted <laughs> literally four performances. Yes. Did you hear that gorgeous song? That's why when you hear that a show called, called Bombs, it's – Usually not because the show is bad. There's so many no. other factors. By the way, Temple Israel just said we should share the link. I'm literally going to do that right now. This is so oh. fun. I'm putting. I'm going to post this right now. Hold on. Oh, there I am. Okay, so Judy Kuhn, actually, we did this through Broadway Plus. You've had so many experiences with Broadway Plus, which is you go to broadwayplus.com, and it's like you get to be yeah. up close and personal with celebrities. Talk about well, the stuff that you've done. Um, I've done uh, – coachings you know virtual uh, unfortunately it's all virtual but i've done um coaching with people 30 and 60 minute coachings i did a workshop with a group um uh and you know i've done meet and greets where people you know for 30 minutes you just have a chat and you know can do q and a's with school groups or really any groups theater companies uh, you know it's a great thing especially Probably right plus. now um uh, especially right now because there's no theater. And pe theater fans and theater artists and people who want to learn or ask questions, you know, you get to meet people at the stage door or, you know, you can't have coachings in person. And it's, it's so it's a kind of a great resource and there's, you know, lots of, and it's a great resource for, the, you know, uh, the community of artists that are on the Broadway, in the part of the Broadway Plus roster because it get, gives us a chance to, have exchange with you know people so with live people yeah. like that actually appreciate yeah, Broadway. No, it's, it's really it's a great it's a great thing. So if you're interested, go to Broadway BroadwayPlus.com and check it out. I've done a lot of the um, uh, like you know my my grandmother's having a birthday. She loves you from the radio. Can you please right. sing one of your favorite songs? Oh, you know, I did also do video shout outs. I just actually recorded yeah. one today for an opening night for gr kids who are doing a production of Beauty and the Beast. People, uh, you know, I, I love really it. I love that kind of celebrity interaction. Um, okay, so mm. here's, but here's what I love about what I was fond about Broadway is like the ups and the downs. Because Rags only lasted four performances, you were then available that same season to star <laughs> in a show that lasted, I think, longer than four performances. Try yeah. four million performances. Les <laughs> <laughs> Miserables, yes. Literally, she true. wouldn't, Judy wouldn't have gotten Les Miserables. So all the people out there that are pursuing the arts, and I'm sure a lot of you have kids that are pursuing it. That is the business that goes up and down. So you yeah, think totally. You know, and there were two two other people who were in Rags who also were cast in Les Mis. So for us, it was you know there there was that silver lining because if sh if Rags had been a hit and had run, we would not have been available to do that show. It's so thrilling. So the thing that everyone knows about Les Mis is um, the crazy turntable. Well, that's one of the things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And by the way, my old joke, but this is not a joke. It's totally true. I actually got to play in the orchestra for, for Les Mis obsessed with it, would always listen to that. But when I finally got cast, be careful what you wish for, I wasn't specific in what I wished for. I wasn't keyboard one, which is, I was keyboard two, so it was literally three and a half hours of this. <laughs> Wonderful whole notes. <laughs> Devastating. But anyway, the point is, turntable, did the turntable ever, did you ever fall off of it? Did it ever stop mid-high note? No, but it did break down on occasion. Um, truth. Uh, actually, the the, ba the the you could say the worst or the best, depending on your um, point of view. The day they very we we did an out of town tryout, I guess you'd call it, in Washington D.C. at the Kennedy Center before we opened on Broadway. That's so odd because the show was already hit on the West End. Uh, I think it was the idea was to give ever you know give the show time to you know marinate and everybody to you know, know what they were doing, work out any kinks. 
Uh, they must have had some deal. I don't know. Uh, who knows? I'm not a producer. I don't know. Exactly. But anyway, so we did a month or two months in, in Washington. It was really great. Um, and, and that's where you're from they, also. And that's where I'm from. So it was a homecoming for me. Um, and uh, for some, we had a really exciting, fun opening night party. And for some reason, they very cruelly scheduled two shows for the day after our opening. Wait a minute. So Let me just remind people. When Les Mis first opened, <laughs> when, I, when I was first doing it, it was Judy, it was three hours and 15 minutes. So it began at 8 o'clock, ended yeah. at 11.15, and then it's opening night. So then you get into your outfit, and then, you know, and you're an yeah, active alcoholic. Yeah, the party alcoholic. started what? at midnight. So it was drinking nonstop, um, <laughs> be honest. We all had it. We were young and having a good time. Mm -hmm. So we all came into the matinee that day, a little like, ooh. And then, of course, you know, the turntable starts, and it's like, ooh. <laughs> oh, God, oh, my God. And after, I don't know how long, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes into the show, all of a sudden, the turntable de decided that it was only going to go at 100% speed in one direction. And, you know, you get, you get used, your body gets used to, you know exactly when the turntable's going to move, how fast it's going to move, and which direction. So your body's ready for that, so you don't go, you know... But this was like, ooh, it took off, and everybody was hanging on to the boxes and whatever was on stage. And it just, they kept, they kept doing that because they were, the guy at the computer was trying to fix whatever it was. And then, and the curtain came down. And uh, we waited for a little while, and they couldn't fix it. And so they canceled the rest of the day. So we all got to sleep uh, off the opening night party. Wait, the gods of alcohol look down on you. <laughs> That is so delicious. And by the way, what people may not know, and after the show, you need, everyone needs to go to YouTube. Judy, bizarrely, because she was in two different shows the same season, there were four shows nominated for Best Musical. Two of them, one of them was Les Mis, one of them was Rags. Judy was literally starring in both numbers. So if you ever watch the Tony Awards, look up <laughs> Rags. She's starring in that. Two minutes later, she's Cosette and Les Mis. I don't think, it's, I don't think anyone's ever done that before. Or since. You mean done two numbers on the Tonys? I'm sure somebody has. I just don't know who. I cannot think of anybody. Temple Israel. I know. These are all two stories, by the way. That is, I can't, I, I bet you. That was the most insane night of my life, basically. I, I bet you no one's ever done it. By the way, Judy and I, I know all these stories about Judy because Judy has done my Broadway cruise. Judy, you were on Sets Big Fat Broadway cruise, I want to say kind of recently, like a year ago maybe, we did a cruise together, Caribbean. Uh, you took her to that I coffee don't... place and like, where is it? It was in that French island. Oh, we like, the, we like the best oh, croissants. Oh, and St. Bart's. St. Yes, Bart's. Yes, yes. That was more than a year ago. I hate to, th you know, we were all prisoners of our homes a year ago. Oh, God. I'm living in denial. Yeah. I, I probably think it was maybe two years ago or maybe even longer. I Sorry. Just, time All right, whatever. Flies. you got to come on another Broadway cruise with me, Judy Kuhn. Okay, yes. Uh, um, at any time. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, so we're going to do a song. This is a song by uh, Frank Lester and Julie Stein. Why don't you talk about this for a second? I first heard this <laughs> before I knew Judy on her album, and I became obsessed with it. Yes, I did a, a, an album of Julie Stein songs many, many years ago, and this was this little novelty song that someone threw my way. I, I can't remember who it was. Um and it's a, a rare collaboration between Julie Stein and Frank Lesser. And it, it, uh, it was from Julie Stein's Hollywood period. It was from the, that famous movie, Sweater Girl. Finally, the silence on this internet is paying off. Yes. <laughs> no one will be <laughs> commenting. I, no one's I, heard of it. I still haven't heard of it. Um, <clears throat> and on a side note, people don't know, Judy and I went to the same college. We went to Oberlin Conservatory. Shout out to the Midwest, Michigan, Ohio. But she is a classically trained soprano, and that's where the song also shows. <clears throat> I refused very coldly. How long can a lady resist? How long can a lady resist? I said no. He said please. I said no. He said please. I said no. He said please, pretty baby. 
I said no. He said why? I said no. He said why? I said no. He said try. I said maybe. He said no. I said well. He said oh, this is swell. And the moonlight in his eyes was sublime. So at last I confess. I said yes. Yes, 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 yes. That's the word I really meant to say all the time. Stupid ending, I love it. <laughs> this is so fun. It was my own special interpretation of that song. Of course, I don't know really what it's meant to be. <laughs> Still got it. Um, okay, so just Kuhn, someone just wrote um, before. Oh, what cruise? Okay, now everyone's talking about the cruise. So, guys, it's you just look up Seth's Broadway vacations. You can find there. We have four cruises coming up, but there's a lot of cruise obsession now, and I don't blame you because now that we're vaccinated. I'm on it. Sets Broadway Cruise or Sets Big Fat Broadway Cruise. But um, some woman just said, oh, my God, my daughter's excited to see the Pocahontas. So talk. did you have to audition for that? Is that one of those like you did a demo? How did it happen? I, it was I, another thing that I just kind of lucked into. Um, they were pitching the idea of a Pocahontas movie to Disney. And Alan Menken and Stephen Schwartz were going to write the songs and they had written one song for it uh, called Colors of the Wind. Perhaps some of you out there have heard of it. Yes, ma'am. Um, some, perhaps some of you have been tortured by it if you have young children. Um, <laughs> again, Mama, again, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, they wanted to do a demo to include uh, in the pitch. And um, I knew Stephen from Rags, and I knew Alan. A li I'd never worked with Alan, but I knew him from around the town. And you were little Shabaharas, by the way. Right. Don't know. And he, uh, and well, he had already at that point written Beauty and the Beast and, and Little Mermaid, Mermaid, right? Of course. And Aladdin, it? actually. No, I think Aladdin was. After. No, I think it was those three, and then Pocahontas. Okay. Anybody, anyone with kids, back me up. <coughs> Anywho, um, he was famous. anyway. Uh, he so anyway, they asked me if I would um, do a demo of the song, and so I went up to um, Alan's house up in Westchester wi with the two of them and recorded it in his home studio. Mm. And um, that's so cool. So you got to hear him be like, "Here's as the song goes." Like I, I still have well the cassette tape, which I've transferred to a disc um, of Alan singing the song, so oh, that I so could cool. l learn it. And um, they anyway, put it in your key, or was it like the same? Like, did they have to change the key? Do you remember? I can't. I don't remember. That's they so must cool. have found the key that they wanted it, me to sing it in. Um, anyway, and then uh, you know, a couple years later, I ran into Stephen, and or maybe a couple years later, or maybe a year. It was a a while later. I ran into Stephen, and and he said they'd greenlit the movie, but they were going to have to cast a Native American, and you know. They loved the, my demo and blah, blah, blah. And anyway, time went on, and I guess they just, they, they couldn't find anyone who they liked the way they sang the song. Wow. So they wound up hiring me to do the songs, and then they found a Native American actress whose speaking voice matched my singing voice, which is really the opposite way they usually do right. these things. But it worked again, out, girl. it worked out for me. <clears throat> yeah, if the camera backed up, you'd see that Judy is really living in a castle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> But those Disney movies do play well. So hold on, have you ever tried out for one of those voices before? Like before? I did. I I I um, 
I did. I think I went in for the Little Mermaid. Is it true, like those auditions, like they don't look at you when you sing? Yeah, no, it's they're blind auditions. So you, they they record you. The casting director records you. I guess goes through, picks the ones they think are maybe the best, and and um, play it for the producers and everybody. And and they just listen. They don't know whose voices they're listening. Wow, to. really. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so cool, Although man. Although I did also audition for Hunchback. I sang a song for Hunchback. And <laughs> Stephen called me up and said, Judy, like he turned my voice. He was like, Judy, you can't do that movie. You're Pocahontas. Oh, like, you got they outed. They asked me to do it. So I <laughs> he did, did recognize the blind audition. <laughs> okay, so wait, before we do the Pocahontas song, because I want I love people looking up videos after this. Everyone, had, There's a YouTube video. You need to look up Judy Kuhn, The Today Show. <laughs> for the aftermath of the story. So what's the pre-math of the story? Oh, of, of the, oh the day of the, the, the premiere in the yes, park. Yes, ma'am, okay. the, well, the Disney accident. Did, did, did Disney, you, in those days, Disney, Disney did these insanely huge, out-of-control premieres. And this one for Pocahontas was in Central Park. They built three, I don't know, 10-story movie screens. Wow. Um, they took over the Great Lawn in Central Park, for those of you who've been there. It's huge. There were 100,000 people there. I don't know. Anyway, we did uh, days of press leading up. And the morning of the day of the premiere, I was on the Today Show singing Colors of the Wind live at the end of the show. And um, the night before, uh, there had been this huge rainstorm giving Disney, I'm sure, many heart attacks. Um, but that day was beautiful. So I, you know, was up at the crack of dawn, hours hair and makeup, was went to, was escorted over to a holding tent where I was waiting to go do maybe do a sound check or li- I can't remember. We were getting very close to the live moment. And um, they were, as they said, we're ready. They were escorting me out of the tent. And somebody right walking right in front of me sort of brushed the edge of the door of the tent. Un- no, uh, unbeknownst to all of us, water from the rainstorm had collected over the door of the tent. So I, just as she brushed the thing, I walked out the door and this <laughs> looks like someone dumped a bucket of water on my head. Lily Carey? And the, the, <laughs> the, the, blood. the looks on all the people surrounding me, the look of shock and horror, especially from the makeup and the hair guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is like you were about to they go on like, the scene. Like, oh, and they, they dragged me over to where there was a station and they the guy was trying to blow dry my hair and the other guy was trying to pat, you know, my face. <laughs> anyway, but if yes, if you do look at that, you'll see that my hair is a little bit plastered to my <laughs> head. It's a slick um, <laughs> slick look. It's not crazy little, but I love that he spent three hours of hair and makeup and it turns out it could actually be done in four minutes. Well, except it didn't look that great. <laughs> yeah, gotta be honest. <laughs> yes. But um, anyway, yeah, it was a total I love Lucy moment. And I'm sure you're such a diva. You had that person fired immediately, right? Oh yes, I had them <laughs> killed. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, okay, let's do. Let's do. This is for the the kids that are watching. This that is wants to hear the kids. The real Pocahontas. Here we go. <laughs> Earth is just a dead thing you can claim. But I know every rock and tree and creature has a life, has a spirit, has a name. You think the only people who are people are the people who look and think like you. But if you walk the footsteps of a stranger, you'll learn things you never knew, you never knew. Have you ever heard the wolf cry to the blue corn moon? Or ask the grinning bobcat why he grinned? Can you sing with all the voices of a mountain? Can you paint with all the colors of the wind? Can you paint with all the colors of the wind? Come 
Run the hidden pine trails of the forest. Come taste the sun sweet berries of the earth. Come roll in all the riches all around you. And for once, never wonder what they're worth. The rainstorm and the river are my brothers. The heron and the otter are my friends. And we are all connected to each other in a circle, in a hoop that never ends. How high does the sycamore grow? If you cut it down, then you'll never know. And you'll never hear the wolf cry to the blue corn moon. For whether we are white or copper skin, we need to sing with all the voices of the mountain, need to paint with all the colors of the wind. You can own the earth and still all you'll own is earth until you can paint with all the colors of the wind. Brava. Brava. And by the way, I agree with Donald. He's like, why couldn't you be Pocahontas and Esmeralda? Leia Salonga was Jasmine and Mulan. So you know what, Stephen Schwartz? That was a rude phone call. I don't um, know. Just saying. Not supportive. Um, okay, so by the way, just a shout out to vaccines. This is I had my Pfizer vaccine yesterday, and it was like, you're going to be so tired. I literally did a full live concert at 3 o'clock, and I'm doing this. Couldn't <laughs> be less tired. So That's I don't great. Know. I had a day of feeling eh after my second shot. But then I was fine. I, th I think my dog wants to get in. Hold on one second. <laughs> He's leaving me all by myself. Is that you, Mandy? <laughs> well, I just hear her commenting in the background. Hold on. My dog is so rude. Thank you, Sandy. Beautiful. What piano are you playing? I love seeing all the clapping. I know that nice. In the comments. It's weird to not have an audience. I know. It's always weird. I'll never get used to it. Hopefully we don't have to get too used to it. It's too nice much to know there longer. is an audience though. That's just so nice. Yes. Thank you, Mandy. Um, someone asked what kind of piano it is. It's a Casio. Because I'm like, really just singing into my computer. Yeah, she's singing, and I'm playing into my computer. But it's anyway. <laughs> um, okay, so this is um, you know Temple Israel in um, West Bloomfield, Michigan. And um, by the way, again, thank you to um, the cancer and to Marty Renee Laker. Um, but we got to talk about yeah, some. Yeah, thanks for having us. It's such a treat to have the chance to sing for people. It really is. It's such a treat. Thank you. Yeah, for it's, it's just not happening giving a lot. Us the privilege. So you were, um, we both share Fiddle on the Roof. You were mm -hmm. Golda on Broadway and the West End. I was the rabbi in my high school. So pretty equal careers there. Yes. Um, uh, so Golda, what we d were just discovering lately for people watching, you know, anyone that grows up in the business, you're like, oh, my God, am I finally old enough to play Golda? My God. Turns out Golda's <laughs> probably like 40. <laughs> like, she's if so that. not old. If that, yeah. If Well, did you say for 25 years? But they just never have a 19-year-old play Seidel, so. Right. Basically, Golda. Except in our production in the West End, she was 19 when we started. Or maybe she was 20. I think we celebrated her 21st birthday during our run. God, so, so young. <coughs> I know. What's she the difference? Six, what? Amazingly talented. That whole cast was great. We're still in the West End. Yeah. What's it like doing a Broadway show versus the West End show? Is there any difference? Uh, not. I mean, not really. But <coughs> it's just a different theater culture there. So Meaning you what? get a much more. Well, it's less expensive. It's much more mm. like built into the culture there. I think yeah. people go to the theater. Well, the way it was in the, America in the 50s and 60s. I, maybe, but I think it's just, you know, there's centuries of theater oh, there. And it's also, um, I just think people, young people go like they go to the movies here. Mm. And it's accessible, it's affordable. So you get much more diverse audience. I mean, diverse in every way, age, economic, race gender so, but so you look out on an audience that really looks more like the city than you do on broadway here yeah. um and that's wonderful and they're just 
They're appreciative in a different way. Really? Isn't it called in an uptight British way? It's rude to well, clap. Well, they're not as vocal. Hmm. So they don't laugh as loud or cheer as much or, you know, all of that, which is fine. But they really listen. Hmm. They don't, you know, the, you, the, it's standing ovations are not like a routine. Like everyone feels like at the end of a Broadway show, you're supposed to stand up. Mm -hmm. They don't feel that way. They stand up. If they stand up, they really, really mean it. And that's a lovely thing, too. And what about, you know, we always talk about how Broadway theaters are so not clean. Like my friend Carrie Butler was doing Les Mis, your show, and she was like, oh, let me put on my shoes for Eponine. And there's a mouse inside, <laughs> Lily Mouse. So like yeah. they're not, so is West End Theater, is it the same way? Is it like not been clean mm -hmm. since Shakespeare? A little bit. You know, they're old buildings. That's the problem. I mean, if anything good comes out of this pandemic, it'll be that the theater owners will finally clean up the air and the environment <laughs> backstage, is. which is really pretty bad. I was literally playing a Broadway <laughs> show, and right above my keyboard was a giant water bug, which is like <laughs> a cockroach. And he was right above me. And the stage, you know, the, the ceiling of the pit is the floor of the stage. So he's, like, clutching on. But everyone on stage was too school. Everyone on stage was, like, a stomping and a stomping, like, shaking <laughs> the ceiling. And I was like, oh, my God. And, and I'm, like, wearing short sleeves. I'm like, when he falls, he's going to literally land. It was terrifying so please god <laughs> clean the theaters and i don't mean i don't remember what happened i blacked out i don't even know if he even fell um That's okay so we're hilarious. gonna we're gonna do a little song from fiddler <clears throat> since we're both almost old enough to play tevi and golda <clears throat> Do you love me? Do I what? Do you love me? Do I love you? With our daughters getting married and this trouble in the town, you're upset, you're worn out. Go inside, go lie down. Maybe it's indigestion. Golda, I'm asking you a question. Do you love me? You're a fool. I know. But do you love me? Do I love you? For 25 years, I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house, given you children, milked the cow. After 25 years, why talk about love right now? The first time I met you was on our wedding day. I was scared. I was shy. <laughs> I was nervous. So was I. But my father and my mother said we'd learn to love each other. So now I'm asking Golda, do you love me? I'm your wife. I know, but... Do you love me? Do I love him? For 25 years I've lived with him, fought with him, starved with him. 25 years my bed is his. If that's not love, what is? Then you love me. I suppose I do. And I suppose I love you too. It doesn't change a thing. But even so. After 25 years, <laughs> it's nice to know. <laughs> it's such a perfect song, isn't it? It is. And Seth, I feel like you and I have probably known each other for about 25 oh years God. now. <laughs> so wait a minute, we are married? You never washed my clothes. <laughs> Sorry. Lazy. Um, okay, hold on. I feel like we have to. Yeah. Okay, we have to. We have to wrap this shiz up, and it's been so fun. Um, okay, I gotta make sure I thank. Well, first of all, everybody in Temple Israel, everybody watching, West Bloomfield, Michigan, and the Cantor who gave such a nice announcement. 
cancer Neil Michaels, who, by the way, said the word Amaz incorrectly, which I really appreciate. Marty and Renee Laker, the Lakers, the team, the Lakers, <laughs> for, for <laughs> sponsoring this whole thing. David Katz for doing our tech so we can actually sing live for you all. Thank yes, David. David. Woo! And Broadway Plus for hooking us up. Um, all right, so Judy, I will hopefully see you on a Broadway cruise and or on a Broadway stage. Yes. Um, okay, we got to set up this last song. Oh, okay. So I can't, uh, if I ask you how many of you have n- know the show She Loves Me, I won't get an answer because you you're it. in Michigan. Um, but in case you don't know the show, I, I played them all. Th- th- I played, I did that show on Broadway. Yes, she was amazing. Um, I saw it. Uh, it was Barbara Cook's signature ingenue role. Um, it's about it. Ta- it's an adaptation of a, an old Jimmy Stewart movie called S- The Shop Around the Corner. Yep. And it's uh, this character Amalia and this character George who work in this shop together, and they hate each other. They fight all the time, and they each have a pen pal who they call dear friend that they have been writing for a, a while. And they're convinced they're in love with, and what they don't know is that they're each other's dear friend. Trickster. So at the end of Act One, they dear f- the dear friends plan to meet, and Amalia's sitting in a cafe waiting for dear friend to show up, and George sees her through the window and realizes she's dear friend, and he comes in and he doesn't tell her, but he ruins the evening, and she thinks dear friend was afraid to come in. And the next day, George feels so bad that he goes to her house and he brings her some vanilla ice cream and he apologizes for his behavior and says, well, dear friend was actually outside and was too shy to come in and she really should write him. And he hints that he's not everything she imagined him to be. And so he convinces her to write a letter. Kind of chunky and losing his hair. And this is the letter that she writes. (coughs) And this is also our finale. And this is our finale. friend. I am so sorry about last night. It was a nightmare in every way. But together you and I will laugh at last night someday. Ice cream Thank you. 
to out my husband i'm like please put my music in order i'm running out of time vanilla ice cream and the last page is i'm a stranger here myself by kurt vile <laughs> literally i had no music for the last page oh well bravo seth yeah would you hit bravo. that b the b is much more impressive <laughs> wow can't do it um thank you everybody in michigan thank you david Katz. thank you cancer thank you thank everyone. you lakers thank you seth bravo judy thank you Kuhn. everyone in michigan judy Kuhn, Broadway star, we love you bye